Um, today's is being hosted by the uh, Animals and Society section of the American Sociological Association. Many of you are probably members, and it's also co-hosted by the Animals and Society Institute. Um, being a member of that group is wonderful. So if you are in the Animals and Society section and aren't currently on their mailing list, make sure you check out the links that I posted and you check them out as well. If you're a part of ASI and you are a sociologist, uh, send me an email because I would love to talk to you about joining our section. Today's presentation is by Valerie Berseth. She's a doctoral candidate in sociology at the University of British Columbia. Her research interests include environmental politics, climate adaptation, and perceptions of risk related to human interventions into nature. She's conducted research in a wide range of contexts, all very interesting, including Pacific salmon, forestry, climate adaptation, social movements, and genomic science. Today, she's presenting research that is part of her doctoral dissertation project with salmon producers working at hatcheries in British Columbia. This research digs into the concept of wildness and addresses how and whether non-human animals produced in artificial breeding programs can be understood as and made sufficiently quote unquote wild. So without further ado, I would like to turn this over to Valerie. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, let me get my screen share set up. Okay, um, so uh, thank you very much, Carol. Uh, thank you to everyone for coming today. Um, and uh, Carol and Ivy have been fantastic behind the scenes in making this possible. Um, so I'm very grateful for your uh, efforts and um, I'm really looking forward to the discussion today. Um, my work so far has been uh, work that I've done coming from uh, an environmental sociology sort of um, background, but what um, really occurred sort of through this work was uh, that I started to understand these kind of interactions between uh, salmon producers and uh, the salmon that they work with, um, not just in terms of sort of a natural resource, but uh, as really interactions between humans and non-humans. And so I've, I'm kind of relatively a newcomer to animals and society um, studies, but uh, I'm hoping to sort of have a discussion today about some of the ways that I can uh, more meaningfully engage with the animals that are a part of this study. Um, so I will start off by uh, acknowledging that the work that I'm discussing today was conducted on the traditional unceded and uh, ancestral territories of the New Channels, Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, Stolo, and Sequetmeg peoples. Um, and I'm also giving this talk uh, as a settler living in Kenyan Keaka territory. And I want to acknowledge um, my obligations to the land and people in these places uh, to continue to learn and do research in a good way. So my work examines this practice of artificial reproduction. In many countries, um, artificial breeding programs propagate and uh, release or relocate millions of plants and animals every year um, into the natural environment. And this is done for several reasons, uh, including to provide opportunities for harvest, so um, such as hunting, fishing, uh, forestry, as well as for conservation objectives to rebuild or su uh, supplement struggling wild populations. And uh, as Carol mentioned in the introduction, the kind of key question for these programs is whether the plants and animals that they produce can be um, understood and made sufficiently wild in order to survive and coexist in the natural environment. But this idea of humans producing wildlife presents an interesting paradox. Um, conventionally from uh, Western views, wildlife and wilderness have been understood as nature that is uh, untouched or uninfluenced by humans. But in order to deal with accelerating biodiversity loss, wildlife conservation typically requires more and more human interventions. 
Um, but there's been uh, very little attention in sociology to how humans are involved in actively producing wildness in animals. Um, and so in my work, I look at artificial breeding programs as fruitful sites to explore how people and organizations wrestle with questions around how much uh, humans should intervene in nature, um, how people uh, perceive and manage the risks of these interventions, um, and what they think of this idea of wildness. So I do this through a case study of Pacific salmon hatcheries. Hatcheries are facilities where um, workers will take sperm and eggs from mature salmon, uh, mix them in buckets, incubate them in the hatchery facility, and then uh, raise the salmon in long tanks called raceways um, until they are old enough to be released into the natural environment. And we do this at a fairly large scale. Uh, Canada releases over 300 million Pacific salmon every year from 23 hatchery facilities in British Columbia. And we're actually far outpaced by other Pacific countries uh, in terms of the number of salmon that are produced and uh, released into the Pacific Ocean. Um, so notably Canada, or sorry, the United States and uh, Japan are significant salmon producers. But recent genomics research has found that hatchery salmon uh, have lower survival rates, um, poor reproductive success, and a number of physical and behavioral differences uh, between them and naturally spawning salmon. Uh, what's more, these changes can occur within just one generation of hatchery production. So in other words, Hatcheries are being made different by, or sorry, hatchery fish are being made different in this process of artificial reproduction. But the success of hatcheries and other similar breeding programs rests on their ability to uh, substitute naturally spawning wild salmon with the salmon that are grown in hatcheries. And uh, this relates to a concept that Foster and colleagues call substitutability or the idea that environmental limits are surmountable because of our ability to replace everything in nature. So I'm interested in this idea of substitutability. Um, and in this study, I look specifically at hatcheries and how they deal with this problem. So I ask, how is wildness understood, produced, and managed in salmon hatcheries? And what role does genomic science play in the production of wildness? So I look at these questions through the lens of biopolitics. Um, drawing on the work of Michel Foucault, research on biopolitics examines how power is exercised in ways that value and support some forms of life over others through controlling various biological processes like birth and reproduction. So a biopolitical approach involves looking at the knowledge and techniques that are used to manage human and non-human individuals and populations. While Foucault's work was uh, originally limited to understanding biopolitics in the context of human populations, there's been a recent growth of uh, studies that are taking this framework to look at uh, human and non-human interactions. Um, and a lot of this work is coming from geography uh, and uh, sociology. So um, as Rosemary Collard notes, biopolitics is not only something that's exercised in the case of domesticated animals. Humans are also actively involved in monitoring, regulating, and intervening in the lives of wild animals. And uh, Iris Braverman um, notes that Contemporary conservation can't be understood simply in terms of wild and tame, um, that a lot of this work involves determining how wild a species is, um, and that there is a lot more value and emphasis placed on uh, animals and species that are more wild. So hatcheries are ideally suited to a biopolitical approach because they're places where um, the state manages salmon lineages, bodies, and reproductive practices. 
Uh, in Canada, hatcheries seek to produce salmon that are as close to wild as possible. And this means uh, that many decisions are made about which salmon to produce, um, how many salmon should be produced and where. So the data for this study come from 46 interviews with uh, people working at the Canadian Federal Department uh, of Fisheries and Oceans. Um, and this is our federal department that manages everything to do with uh, salmon. So I interviewed six genomic scientists, 13 people working at the management level of the salmon enhancement program. So that's uh, what we call the hatchery program in Canada. Um, and then 27 people who work at 15 different hatchery facilities. And uh, I looked specifically at how these different actors uh, defined wildness, what practices are used to produce wildlife, and what forms of life are targeted for intervention. So overall, what I found in this work is that in the context of artificial breeding, wildness is understood as a function of genetics. And through interviews with hatchery staff and managers, um, I found that genomic science has had a significant impact on uh, altering the way that hatcheries operate. Um, genomic science allows hatcheries to translate this concept of wildness into practice. Um, by enabling them to distinguish between wild and domesticated forms of life. This means that hatcheries can adjust what they do in order to reshape salmon to be more genetically wild. As a result, um, wildness is understood and practiced differently depending on the scale that you look at. So I'll go through each of these scales in turn. So if wildness is genetic, what is a wild gene? There were two interpretations that respondents had for what a wild gene means. One is that it's a function of lineage. So a wild gene is a gene that's passed on from wild parents and wild grandparents. The other uh, interpretation of this is through natural selection. So wild genes are genes that allow salmon to survive in the natural environment. And in Canada, there are no interventions in terms of sort of editing or modifying genes at this level. Um, but these ideas of wild as genetic in terms of lineage and natural selection informed how decisions are made at other levels. So moving up from genes, now we're looking at individual salmon. So what is a wild salmon? In Canada, the wild salmon policy uh, is a federal policy that we have uh, that sort of establishes uh, the practices and guidelines for how to conserve wild salmon. Um, and there they define a wild salmon as one that is two generations removed from the hatchery system. So a hatchery fish is not wild, but if it returns and spawns in the natural environment over two generations, its grandchildren could become wild salmon. But if a hatchery fish and a wild fish are swimming in the same river, how can you tell them apart? So there are two ways that this is done in practice. One is that hatcheries will remove the adipose fin, which is this small fin on the back of a salmon towards the tail. Um, and by removing this, it means that when they sort of go out to the ocean and swim back to freshwater rivers to spawn, uh, fishers can look to see if it has this fin or not. Um, if it doesn't, that means it's a hatchery fish. And uh, what this means is that fishers can then target hatchery fish specifically while letting wild salmon return to spawn the next generation. But not all hatcheries mark their salmon. So another method for telling if an individual is wild is by analyzing its DNA. And this way hatcheries can screen out hatchery fish um, and use only wild salmon in their breeding programs. So moving up from the individual scale, uh, this next level asks, how wild is this fish in this environment? Epigenetics is a branch of genomic science that looks at how your environment changes the way that your genes are expressed. Some studies have shown that hatchery environments produce salmon that are less fit to survive in the wild. 
So some hatcheries are experimenting with making their rearing uh, environments look more like natural spawning habitat, which you can see on the right. And so they'll do this by introducing rocks, um, branches, any kind of debris that they can. Uh, sometimes it means that a hatchery worker will walk along the tank with a plastic fish and kind of wave it over the salmon um, in order to scare them. So all of these are different sort of experiments that individual hatcheries are doing uh, to try and alter salmon genetic expression towards something that they think is more close to what would occur in the wild environment. But what's interesting here is this push to alter salmon genetic expression isn't coming from a top-down science policy. It's driven by the concerns of a few individuals working at hatcheries um, who are uh, particularly aware of and concerned about the risks that they are posing to the salmon that they produce. Um, and so while they may not have formal training in genomic science, they are evolving their practices in response to new genomic knowledge, as well as their own views of wildness and uh, ethics about how to care for the salmon that they produce. So now moving up beyond individual fish, we're now looking at wildness in terms of salmon families. Um, so here, the impacts of how wildness is defined and produced have impacts on a larger scale. At this level, um, we're looking at essentially the main activity in a hatchery, which is pairing males and females um, to produce thousands of uh, salmon offspring every year. So at this level, um, using genomic science, the Canadian government is starting to map out salmon family trees using a genomic tool called parentage-based tagging. And what this does is it allows um, hatchery staff to select males and females that will produce more genetically wild families. And this technology is not currently being used for this specific purpose, but there were some hatchery workers who um, expressed a desire to use parentage-based tagging to mimic what they see as natural mating behaviors of salmon. So for example, this hatchery worker says, I don't think fish would naturally select a partner that's radically different than its own size. I think large fish would tend to seek out another large partner. So they saw parentage-based tagging as a way to, in the hatchery system, select for uh, large salmon to breed with large salmon and produce larger offspring. Where this technology is being used is in some cases where there's extreme conservation concern, um, what they'll do is they'll uh, use DNA analysis to check every fish that comes back to the hatchery. And if it's not part of the genetically unique stock that they are trying to conserve, those salmon are killed. So there have been some disagreements and tensions among the staff about how ethical this practice is. Um, for example, this technician sees ethical issues with killing fish that from their view don't need to be killed. Um, they see it as more natural for salmon to mix genetics across different rivers than it is for humans to intervene and try and make some sort of ideal strain of fish. So looking at salmon at the level of population, the question here is how wild is a particular river? So respondents talked about different risks that hatchery fish can pose to wild salmon at the population level, including overcrowding rivers, consuming the limited food that's available, um, and passing on inferior genes by mating with wild salmon in the same river. So uh, a new method for calculating the wildness of a river is um, what's called PNI or proportionate natural influence. But basically what you're doing here is calculating the percentage of naturally spawning fish in a river and then classifying this river according to this chart from at the top, this is a very wild river because there's more than 
of the salmon here are wild. Um, or, you know, at the very bottom, this is a very hatchery influenced river where less than 25% of the salmon are wild. So what this does is it provides a stream by stream assessment of wildness that can be used in uh, the annual plans that hatcheries make uh, where they determine how many fish they produce, when they should release hatchery salmon, um, and which rivers and creeks uh, they should use in order to release those salmon. Um, and one of the interesting things about this new tool is that it's allowing communities to set targets for how wild they want the rivers in their area. And lastly, at the level of salmon species, the focus here is on wildness in terms of overall hatchery contributions to the ecosystem. So to increase the wildness of Pacific salmon species, this might mean closing hatcheries or drastically reducing uh, the amount of salmon that are produced. And these decisions are based on several factors, including uh, a balance of economic and conservation interests. However, hatcheries have enormous public support and the subject of closing hatcheries in particular has been uh, what some respondents described as hush hush and taboo um, in the department. So uh, it wasn't until very recently that this is something that people would even bring up as an option. Um, now, as this hatchery biologist explains, they're starting to be able to talk about closing hatcheries, um, but this person still sees it as unlikely. So this shows that there are limits to how far people within and outside of the hatchery system are willing to go in this pursuit of wildness. So in the context of artificial breeding programs for Pacific salmon, um, I found that alongside some references to wildness as uh, nature that is separate from human influence, um, respondents also described wildness in terms of genetics. And this isn't just sort of a shift in how people think about wildness, but it's also something that's been translated into practice as hatcheries are uh, altering the way that they do uh, their sort of like breeding programs, um, as well as the physical environment, uh, in order to reshape salmon to be more genetically wild. Um, I also found that salmon in this process weren't fully reduced to just being a collection of genes. Uh, several respondents emphasized the agency of salmon to choose what rivers they go to um, and what partners they want to mate with. So this suggests that genetic science hasn't fully replaced uh, conventional ideas about wildness and naturalness. Um, but that the meaning of wildness is being transformed by new genetic knowledge and changing understandings of the role of humans in wild nature. So um, what I'm kind of proposing through this work is that wildness is better understood as a multidimensional concept where something can be understood as wild based on its history so at some point in its life or in its lineage, um, was it influenced by humans and uh, how much does that matter? Um, and it can also be understood as wild by its properties. So does it have, for example, a genetic profile that corresponds to naturally reproducing individuals in the same species? And this expanded meaning of wildness is also accompanied by an expansion of biopolitical interventions into animal lives, animal bodies, and ecosystems. And what I think the case of Pacific salmon shows is that not all forms of life are desired and valued. Genomic science enables hatchery workers to distinguish between wild and domesticated forms of life and to encourage the proliferation of wildness at multiple levels from genes to species. Um, and at the same time to weed out domesticated life or to target it for harvest or death. 
some of these tools, um, such as genomic sequencing, fin clipping, uh, parentage-based tagging, are more diagnostic in that they help hatchery workers to differentiate between wild and domesticated life. Others are more um, direct interventions, such as uh, reshaping the physical spaces where salmon are raised. Um, and this practice of culling fish that might threaten the uh, lineages of particularly genetically unique stocks that are trying to be conserved. Um, and lastly, uh, there are also tools of assessment. So these uh, calculations of how wild a river is or the management plans that determine whether a hatchery should be open or closed. Uh, that involve kind of assessing and quantifying wildness at higher scales in order to adjust the scope of human interventions into the natural environment. Um, and what I think is, is particularly uh, important about this is that conservation work tends to be discussed in terms of species. But if you only look at salmon at the species level, uh, you'd miss a lot of the other ways that humans are altering salmon in ways that affect their survival and their ability to sort of uh, coexist with naturally spawning fish. Um, what I found in this work is that this pursuit of wildness is also uneven. Um, and I found that there was greater experimentation within hatcheries and less ability to pursue wildness at higher levels of the institution. Um, and I think this underscores some of the limitations of genomic science to solve environmental problems. While smaller changes in hatchery practices can help shift salmon to be closer towards an image of wildness, um, there are also other aspects of the human-animal relationship that can't be addressed through technological advancements alone. Um, I'm thinking here specifically of this question of whether or not to close hatcheries or reduce production um, that would require more engagement with the general public about the value of wild salmon uh, and particularly in the context of other values like uh, fishing economies and the cultural value of having abundant salmon, whether they're from a hatchery or not. So one of the key takeaways that uh, I kind of hope to leave people with is that there's a real need for sociologists to engage with some of the recent advances in genomic science. Um, there's so far been very limited engagement between these fields, and most of the work in sociology that looks at genomics is focused on human health and medical applications. Um, but genomic science is being used to alter nature in uh, new and complex ways. And I think it's important for uh, us as sociologists to be aware of what changes are occurring um, and also to look at the material consequences that these have for animals and ecosystems. And uh, I also think that sociology has some important contributions to make to this conversation about uh, genomic technologies. First, by shedding light on the dynamics here between humans and animals, um, as well as through careful attention to contextual factors that affect how people perceive and manage the risks of interventions. Um, and lastly, I think that uh, there are ways that sociologists can uh, uniquely address issues of power and the production of knowledge. So I found that even though hatchery staff and managers are not experts in genomic science, they do have a deep knowledge about the salmon that they interact with. And um, they're aware of the genetic risks involved in hatchery production and their evolving practices as new tools are introduced. Um, at the same time, for some of the staff that work in hatcheries, the official guidelines and policies that are set for uh, hatcheries at higher levels may not re uh, reflect their own views of wildness or um, their partic particular ethical views of 
how to care for the populations that they're trying to conserve. Um, I've also uh, talked about genomic science today in the context of a very specific Canadian settler uh, governmental uh, context, but um, Indigenous ways of knowing and managing salmon are also uh, an essential part of this picture. And First Nations in Canada and tribal governments in the United States are uh, key actors in uh, running hatcheries and are also adopting uh, and responding to genomic technologies in ways that reflect their values, uh, knowledges, and beliefs. So I think there's a real need to understand here how different knowledges inform decision-making in artificial breeding programs, um, as well as some of the power dynamics across uh, different types of knowledge uh, and different um, rights holders uh, and stakeholders. So I'm not sure what my time is, but uh, I'm gonna leave it there. I hope I didn't go too far over. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge my research participants, uh, my supervisor uh, and my colleagues and collaborators on uh, the larger project that my work was a part of, uh, which is EPIC4. Um, okay, so thank you. Thank you so much, Valerie, for that presentation. It was wonderful. Um, I know nothing about hatcheries. So for me, um, it, was, it was a lot of new knowledge to, to bring in there. Um, I'd like to open up the rest of this to question and answer. And keep in mind that Valerie also mentioned, um, sorry, there's a hand poking up. I have my, my baby with me too. I have an assistant over here. Um, Valerie also mentioned that she is interested if you have any insights from your own work that you would like to share with her. This is a colloquium, so it can be collaborative as well. Um, and if you have any insights into human animal studies that you think might um, benefit and further her work, she would love to hear that as well. But we will also take questions about this research as well. Does anyone have a question to start? You can just, um, if you just use the raise your hand signal, I can just call on you and you can unmute yourself. Or if you're uncomfortable doing that, you can go ahead and type it in the chat. Um, Ken. Yes, hi. Thank you for that. Um, I'll turn on my video here. Oh, I'm in the dark. <laughs> Well, I found the talk enlightening, even if I am still in the dark. Uh, so I, a question I have is, um, what's the relationship between uh, these hatcheries that you're describing, whose intent is to uh, enhance or rewild uh, salmon, and what I've been hearing about, which is that uh, there are an awful lot of salmon that are consumed now that are products of uh, fish farms. And I, I'm very concerned with um, a movement toward uh, industrializing fishing in the same way in which we industrialized uh, land animals for consumption. So what, what is that relationship? And uh, what are your thoughts about um, factory farming of fish? Uh, it's definitely um, more complex than I than I expected when I started out. Um, so, uh, for people who might not be familiar, uh, fish farms or or aquaculture uh, involves similar breeding practice of taking males and females and and producing more salmon. Um, but what a fish farm does is they will keep those salmon uh, typically in uh, net pens in the ocean or um, there is some kind of push to get it out of the ocean and move it uh, to a land-based facility. So uh, what I found in British Columbia, the subject, and I think generally in the Pacific Northwest, um, the subject of fish farming is really uh, at the forefront of people's uh, awareness of uh, sort of harmful practices to salmon. There's a lot of social movements that target fish farming um, and generally the push is to get them out of the ocean because they have uh, the potential for spreading disease and pests to uh, naturally spawning salmon. 
But what, what people talk less about is hatcheries that are more aimed at conservation. And so when I started this work, it felt like I was reaching out to people and saying, what do you think about hatcheries? And they kind of were like, I haven't really thought much about it. I've thought a lot about fish farms, but I, I haven't really thought of, I, I just kind of assumed that the conservation type of hatcheries are wild. But when people started to look more into some of the genetic effects, um, they started to question that. And so that's really where I think this is an interesting space to look at because fish farming can tend to be very much like an agricultural conventional model um, of, as you said, like industrializing fish for production. Um, but what, what these kind of hatcheries are doing is trying to as, as closely as possible mimic what, what's happening in the wild and yet there are still influences. And so one of the questions is, okay, well, what do we do with that information? Do we change our practices here too? Um, and uh, so I think that people are starting to be more concerned about hatcheries that are conservation based, um, but it's still not, I think, to the same level of impact as the uh, fish farms would have. And I hope that answers your question, Ken. It's a very, uh, very important topic. Thank you. Hi, and then we have a question in the chat from Tracy. Um, can you talk a bit more about Indigenous nations and traditional Indigenous knowledge regarding salmon? Are there interesting collaborations? Are Native nations working within the hatcheries, the hatchery managed systems? Uh, thank you, Tracy. So. Um, Yes, there are. I can speak more directly to the Canadian context because that's what I'm more familiar with. I know that there are probably uh, significant differences uh, in the United States. Um, but in Canada, First Nations are, uh, they often have a hatchery um, if they are located in an area where salmon spawn. Um, those are sometimes federally funded, sometimes they are independently funded by the nation. If they are federally funded, they need to submit to the sort of standard regulations and procedures that the Canadian government uses in their hatcheries. Um, so there are definitely, I think, reasons why nations might want to stay outside of the system. Um, I am currently working with uh, people at uh, the New Channel Tribal Council on looking at ways to um, understand some of the genetic uh, aspects of hatchery production and ways that they can kind of uh, establish hatcheries that are in line with their particular views uh, and traditional knowledge. So um, it's not something that I have a lot of information on yet, but um, so far in a lot of those conversations, uh, I'm surprised, like I, I'm constantly sort of uh, learning new things about different ways to understand salmon. Um, for example, I think one of the biggest differences is there's a real focus on salmon as active agents who decide their own fate and who uh, choose where they go. And that, that perspective really comes strongly in the conversations that I've had in Indigenous contexts. Um, so I'm looking forward to learning more about that for sure. Um, I have a question for you. Um, so I, you know, this is really new to me. So um, when you say conservation, so I conjure up some, some ideas, but I'd be interested if you could maybe explain in case my ideas are wrong um, about sort of why these hatcheries were initially started. What was their purpose? Because I imagine the purpose behind them probably impacts the type of people who want to go work in them and the sort of political um, grounding surrounding them. And then that would impact how we think about and talk about the salmon as individuals that are impacted by these practices, as well as the environmental consequences. Yeah, the they do have a while, while today they have a strong conservation focus, that certainly is not how they originated. Um, so uh, in both Canada and the United States in the 1970s, that's when these two countries kind of really started to produce a lot of salmon in hatcheries. And the explicit goal was to uh, provide fish for uh, fishing. 
Um, and so in Canada, the goal was to double the amount of fish caught every year, um, which is enormous in terms of thinking about this as like, we're just putting, it doesn't matter what fish they are. We're just putting out more fish for people to catch them. Um, and what started to happen is people realized that while hatchery production was going up, fish population numbers were going down. And so there was something happening here that these hatcheries aren't doing what they were intended to do. And so that prompted investment into the science around what are we doing here? Is it having an impact or not? Um, and people definitely described sort of generational shifts in terms of uh, a kind of an old guard working at the hatchery that has that mindset that you're just sort of, it's all about just production, um, but that younger generations of people are coming in with more of a sort of conservation biology training. Um, and so they are thinking differently about this. Um, yeah, but that, that definitely is still a mindset for a lot of the, there are different scales really. There are some hatcheries that are massive that uh, contribute most of the salmon for a large geographic area. And then there are like smaller conservation focused ones. And so that does really make a difference. Thank you. That that's very, that's fascinating. Um, does anyone else have a question or comments? If, yeah, go ahead, Ken. Yeah, if no one else, I'll, I'll just ask a question, uh, sort of putting on a, a, an animal advocate hat. Um, so if, um, if we're producing uh, through the hatchery uh, animals that are replenishing a diminishing wild population, uh, it is, I, th I think a radical animal rights person might say, well, that is not dealing with the uh, underlying problem, which has to do with things like the construction of dams. Um, so is there any uh, legitimacy to that objection? Definitely, I think there's, I mean, I guess this is where I'm sort of uh, speaking personally, sort of in my uh, view as I've come to learn about this. Um, I think it's very legitimate to question uh, the legitimacy of, of hatcheries as a, as a blanket approach to sort of solving all problems. Like that really was how they were initially seen as this panacea, this sort of like solution to all of our problems. Um, and I think that in a lot of cases, what happens is just because you put out a large number of fish doesn't tell you anything about how the ecosystem is operating. You know, is there enough food in the system for salmon uh, without these hatchery uh, numbers coming in? Um, and your point about dams is particularly relevant for the United States where that it was sort of like wherever there's a dam, you put a hatchery and no problem. Um, but actually there's been a movement to take down uh, dams that have been blocking salmon spawning habitat because it's just not it's just not solving the problem and you're seeing species and populations that get pushed closer to extinction and there's kind of this push to act um, to remove some of these band-aids and and let the system regenerate itself um, so I think that that concern you, you you're pointing to is really shared by a lot of people who are starting to look at this now and say this is not the solution we thought it was. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we have another comment in the question to tag on to Ken's question. This is coming from Liz Herkey. Um, so to tag on to Ken's question, I wonder if you gained any insights into how when wearing an advocate's hat, we might improve approaching different constituencies who might not have the same ideas about animal sentience or rights. Mm -hmm a great question that um, I think one of the things that came out of this work is that people had very particular views about the animals that they interact with, but they rarely talked to people 
from a different sort of group. Like this, this is part of a larger study. So I interviewed people in recreational fishing, commercial fishing, um, environmental stewardship groups, and there weren't a lot of opportunities for them to engage with people from different areas of salmon production and harvesting and, and management. So um, I think a first step in this case would be to have some of those conversations directly um, to say, you know, what are we uh, looking for out of these hatcheries? How are we interacting with salmon? And specifically ask that question about animal sentience. It's just not something that comes up very often. Um, so when I ask people, they have opinions about it, but um, uh, I think stimulating some of that conversation would be really valuable. Um, yeah. Um, I, I have another question, but I want to see if anyone else here has a question before I take too much space. Okay, so um, this is, you know, something for future research. You might not have thoughts on it yet, but I'd love to hear any thoughts if you do have on it. Um, oh, and I do see another question as well, but I'll go ahead and get this one out of the way. Um, you talked about the difference between domestic and wild and how it seems okay to use animals in one situation versus another. And that mm -hmm. seems like when thinking about human animal studies, it's really important to demarcate what these distinctions are. And then whether this distinction means you can use something more if it's domesticated or whether you have to protect it more or if that differs based on the species. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder if you, you know, digging into fish, which is, is unique because um, a lot of people see fish in mass rather than as in, have a harder time seeing them as individuals. I'm wondering if you've thought about this problem or have any ideas. Um, yeah, two, two thoughts come to mind. One is the, um, I guess there's this uh, effect of one of the, the aspects of a social movement in BC against fish farming is the call for people to only eat wild salmon. Um, and so it, it's kind of this, this uh, sort of, as you put it, like, can you use domesticated or is it more valuable to consume wild salmon um, because there's something sort of ethically guiding your decision there. And so um, there are, for example, top restaurants in Vancouver that have decided no longer to serve salmon at all because they, uh, they just think that um, by targeting wild salmon and saying, okay, we can only ethically eat wild salmon, you're now putting a lot of extra pressure on um, a handful of individuals that are struggling already. So I think that this is very much an open question right now that people are starting to think more about and having a sort of second thoughts about what does it mean to just say, okay, well then we can use the wild salmon because they are the ethical salmon. Um, yeah, and then I had another thought that is completely gone. <laughs> I should have written it down. <laughs> well, my question is very similar actually to Carmen's. And so maybe reading Carmen's question will yeah will uh, have your thought come back, but do you consider that considering an, an animal as quote unquote wild reduces the ethical consideration of that animal? Yes, I, I think that definitely the, this idea that um, maybe it's not only fish farms that are producing domesticated animals makes us now think very carefully in more, I think it requires a lot more sort of um, like you said, this is a very new topic for a lot of people and there's a lot going on. And so I think um, it's really prompting people to uh, dig deeper and learn more about all the ways that we actually impact animals just by, I think the one like really clear message that came out of the epigenetics research is just the environment that you're in has an effect. And, um, so I think that a lot of what this work is doing is raising questions and not answering a lot. I think that there's a lot that people need to um, sort of uh, reflect on and interact with to, to really have this conversation. Um, but I definitely think that there's ethics in terms of uh, what we consume as people who, who like salmon, who want to eat salmon, but there's also ethical considerations as people who um, produce and, and directly impact salmon lives. 
Oh yes, I do recall the the thing that the thought that came to mind. So one of the um, one of the things that happened when I was at I, I went to several. Um, there's lots of festivals and events that are held to mark the return of the salmon every year, and so I went to one where there were people from the government who were there to speak with communities about about salmon, and one of the people who is responsible for writing policy about salmon got up on stage and said. Uh, today was my first time ever seeing a salmon in person. Um, and that was a comment that really uh, resonated in a very negative way for a lot of people who were there, because this is a person who's responsible for all of these animals, and um, they have no direct personal connection to it. So uh, the, the question of considering an animal as wild and what sort of ethical questions does that raise, I think it, it asks us to think about who are all of the people who are in decision-making roles here? Um, and how are they sort of relating to the animals that they're impacting? Thank you. So I, um, I believe that this is just one chapter of your dissertation research, correct? Yes. Um, do you mind telling us what your dissertation project is when you're, are you finishing it this year or is this something that's, um, you know, in the, the middle stage? It's definitely not in the beginning stages. <laughs> No, I actually, um, uh, I defended a couple weeks ago, and so I am finished. <laughs> so, yay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, there were two other chapters that uh, had a, different focuses. Um, <laughs> thank you, Carmen. Um, so one chapter was looking at how the wildness of hatchery salmon has been classified and debated in laws and policies. And so I compared Canada and the United States, um, where in the United States, the conversation was, um, you know, do we count hatchery salmon when we're sort of assessing if a river of salmon is endangered or not? Um, and it went through a court battle. And so what happened was over, you know, eight years, hatchery fish went from wild to not wild to wild to not wild because these decisions kept getting reversed. Um, and so it's just a, a really interesting way to think about, you know, the, um, the different arenas where we're thinking about salmon and we're, we're sort of classifying them. Um, in Canada, it was more a uh, uh, consultation process between a lot of different uh, stakeholders, rights holders about how they see salmon. Um, and that was what led to the, the sort of wild salmon policy. And then my third chapter looks at, so this question of selective breeding. If we know everything that we can know about uh, salmon families, we have the ability to select for salmon according to particular um, uh, characteristics. And so I look at, you know, should we use hatcheries to breed salmon that are able to withstand certain, uh, like, uh, sort of changing climate conditions? Can they withstand higher temperatures and stuff like that? Um, and so there I found that, uh, in general, people were not in support of using genomic science to produce climate resilient salmon. But there was a lot of interest in using genomic science to address some of the problems that we're already seeing. So as Ken said, you know, to rewild salmon. Um, and so that was an interesting sort of uh, result because I thought it was going to be more sort of for or against genomic technology, but actually it was a really layered conversation about where and when is it okay to use this technology. And for a lot of people, they see the potential for some very positive outcomes. So, um, yeah, sorry, that was like. Uh, oh no, that was great. Very I, fresh in my mind. Um, no, that's great. I I feel really lucky that we get uh, to be some of the first people. I'm sure you presented <laughs> some of this other places, but to hear this, and I I hope that you continue this work. And we have one more. Oh, we have a comment from Ken that the use of the term fish rather than fishes is a linguistic support for de-individualizing mm. fish, which is very, very true. As Carol Adams would say, it's a mass term, right? Um, so always good to keep in mind when you are writing this up, maybe into a book. I don't know, maybe we'll be that lucky. It sounds like you did a lot of work. So um, does anyone have any last comments before we, before we get off and go for the day? 
I would like to thank everyone for coming. We're going to have another colloquium next month. So if you are a member of the Animals and Society section of the ASA, you get plenty of emails from me reminding you about these. And if you are a member of ASI, I know that Ivy uh, keeps everyone updated with newsletters about when all of these events are. So thank you everyone so much for coming. And um, we hope to see you at the next one. And thank you so much, Valerie, for teaching us all about your research and such a great presentation as well. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to everyone for the discussion. And I would be very happy to connect with people outside of this and uh, continue talking and learning a little bit more about what you do. Thank you, Carol. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Valerie. Thanks.